know, and so, and so we, so then we, we, you know, I would have to go next door and say, Miss Renita, some more white people are coming. <laughs> you know, and I want to make sure it's okay. And then I remember the University of Chicago wanted to have an event, and like all of the like board of trustees and people like that, and they wanted to have ballet. <laughs> Outside my crib, you know what that like? It was like you know, and I and it was wrecking me because I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. So some brothers came by as the valet was setting up, and the valet was Hispanic. These some Mexican brothers. So then the brothers were like, "Damn, man, Mr. Gates, can't you you know, we could have valeted these cars." <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. And, and uh, you know, yeah, but, but essentially I said, look, let me, let me holler at my folk. The three of you, I want you to be my scout for the block. I need y'all to take that corner. You take that corner, you take that corner, you take it. It was like, it was like summer week. And they knew exactly what to do. They were like, oh, we got a, we got a command chief. We can do this. You know? but, but that willingness, instead of, and then I remember that day we, we barbecued. So the fancy dinner was happening in the back, and I asked them to set up one of the grills in the front and like barbecue some hamburgers and some hot dogs, and, like you just like get the kids involved. And anyway, it turned out to feel like a block club party, right on the front, on the front side, and then there were like all these fancy people in the back. And then when the, when the live music started, my boy Yao, he sings really well. Yao started singing, and then the alley fills up, and it was like all these other people. And then eventually will, but it, but it but it it really has something to do with one your capacity to communicate complicated things over time and trust, like you said, trust that you ain't got to dumb down a complicated social in, in, in interaction. Like you ain't the first rich Negro on the block, and you ain't the one only one. My name got a Porsche, and I drive a two thousand Volvo. You know, and so I think it's it's. But it's this preoccupation, like when we get a little bit, we got to go. And so I really hope that we get a chance to talk about black space. And because a lot, I think one of the other things is that we're all involved, the three of us are involved in a, in a thing that is very much about land, too. Okay. Land and buildings. But, and, and more. And more. Um, for me, I would always say that intent, what is my intent to be here, and sort of, sort of transparency, and a belief. I truly believe in contemporary ideas, or contemporary, I, I find us interesting, I find our ideas interesting, and I find the practitioners interesting. So I never felt that I wanted to take anything away from my neighborhood, I just simply wanted to add another page, make the conversation just just extend the conversation. I never I never looked out and thought that they're not going to I never thought that there would be any pushback. Well, because why would there be pushback? I didn't see what I um doing as being anything different than say a new business coming into the community and you wonder for a look, oh I wonder what's gonna be in the, oh it's gonna be a wig shop or oh it's gonna be a restaurant. So I just had the belief that we would both benefit. And I and I always and I always stood on that and i and I Yeah, I mean, it's the thing. I just always believed it would always be okay. Because the intent was okay. There wasn't, I wasn't using it as an art world strategy. I wasn't using it as a platform for something else. I genuine, had a genuineness to see this kind of conversation happen in the Merck Park with the citizens of the Merck Park and people from other neighborhoods. But when you were speaking about land, not changing what we think about, but changing the context that we do it in. I just 
he's found that very interesting. But don't you think it's like a, it's, I mean, you know, these kind of things about trust is a, this is an ongoing thing, though, right? I mean, we, we're always in the middle of that, you know, of trying to to position ourselves in uh, in our own for our own sense of trusting that we're doing the right thing, you know, but also in the context of you know, new people that are coming into stuff all the time. You know, they just you know, they don't know, you know. And uh, I mean, I know in, in our neighborhood here. Um, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting to see how, you know, people kind of move through. One of the interesting things is when, you know, you know the high level of incarceration in, in the area. You know, and if every once in a while you see people who may have been a part of this neighborhood 30 years ago, you know, and they're just getting out and they come back going, what in the world happened here? You know, I mean, this is, this is not, you know, what I, you know, what I know. And there's a, there's a certain kind of, you know, and it, you know, I always try to respect that, though. You know, I try to respect when people question, because then it gives us an opportunity to kind of question ourselves and, and question that intent. You know, and which way is it going? Yeah. I think that's also interesting because of your position in the art world, that your spaces have become this sort of nexus for exchange. Oftentimes, as Fiesta was alluding to, you know, there's a busload of people coming here that ordinarily are not here. Uh, and that, in and of itself, that begins another sort of catalyst for people wanting to be there. And it, inadvertently, it's the nature that it changes. I think that question about urgency, I, well, Limerick Park being, uh, and I don't know the state of Limerick Park now, but I know what it used to be. Historically, third ward, what it used to be historically versus what it was when you arrived to convert those abandoned buildings. Uh, you know, south side of Chicago, which has gone through an illustrious history, which has also fallen on hard times. These are places that have historical spaces of blackness that have been reclaimed, and in and of itself, it creates a catalyst for even more change. Would, and you become the, the, the pinpoint of that happiness. Yeah, so, so this, this, is, this is kind of exciting because I, I do think that there's a way in which um, local government, city government, mm -hmm. local philanthropy, maybe black individuals that live in a place and then they move from that place and don't go back, mm -hmm. that there are all these things that work against some of these places where we live. Now, a lot of us, you know, we may have grown up in Third Ward, we moved <coughs> to a more affluent, kind of more homogeneously middle class place, but we come back to church on Sundays. And so we, we see, we, we move in and out of this kind of psycho, this, this, this geography that is both home and like history and then not, right? And I think that, that one of the things that was important for me on the block was to simply Model, and, yet, and this is some, you know, this is my thing. Simply, simply model that one could have an extremely cool life in the hood, in the, in the hood of your grandmother, in the two flat that you that y'all owned for a long time, and and really try to demonstrate that there is there is value if we brush, pull back the weeds, mow the lawn, paint the house, make it real pretty. And it's probably more affordable and more efficient, and, and you know, it's, and, and that that modeling could have um, policy-based affects, like like we could change the way the city imagines itself, where philanthropic community is willing to invest, um, where investors might want to be uh, more supportive, because at least in my neighborhood, they imagine no good thing could ever happen there again. And so so the, what feels artistic is that nobody else is willing to do the brain, the creative work, the the miracle, the miracle no less than a miracle. No, no one's willing to do the, the miraculous work. Uh, and I think that it takes weirdos to do the miraculous <laughs> work. But, but creative people who also have a sense of strategy, strategy and urgency. But you know, but actually, to be, uh, you know, but to carry that a little bit further, though, a lot of it, though, is 
I mean, the, the, the notion about creativity, right, and how well the, whether people can be creative enough to uh, uh, to make things happen. I, you know, when I, I worked on a, a, a project in um, in a uh, uh, little town called Anyang, Korea, it's outside of Seoul, and and you know, it was interesting how they did it. They had this interesting dynamic that was very similar to here. It was, but on a scale that was just amazingly different, right? So this old little part of town, three to five story uh, buildings, lots of markets and people living there. And, you know, it was all it looked great to me, like, you know, typical uh, Korean neighborhood. But the master plan was for them to wipe out 25 blocks and replace it with 30 to 50 story high rises in a period of five years, right? And so, in the chat, in the question that came up there was that, you know, how do, you know, of course it was going to displace people, they couldn't live, they get whatever, but the weird thing is they were going to lose their businesses, right? And, uh, and so, the big question for me was like, you know, is there something that could happen that could be a catalyst for saving some of the businesses, the livelihood of some of these people in the new developments. And so we set up this whole competition structure and whatever. And then it, it hit me. I was like, the problem with, with that model was partly from the top, that people from the top were just developing down on these people at the bottom. But the other problem is that the people at the bottom, the, the, the small shop owners, were not being creative and innovative in terms of how do you provide a product? that can sustain in this new environment. It took me going to Korea to come back to Houston and say, damn, that's the same thing that happened in our neighborhood. You know, I mean, it's like, you know what, when, when, when desegregation happened, you know, all the money didn't leave this neighborhood just, you know, just because the stores, I mean, people, the business people that had them there, they all went away. But you know what, there were not people in place that were thinking creatively of how to capture that money that's still here. Right? And so it took all that time for me, and now one of the things that Project Doorhouses is really focusing on now is really you know, how do we incubate you know, people that want to be creative and want to explore you know, creative ways to uh, provide industry you know, in the neighborhood. And so, you know, I mean, so a lot of that is, is about create, you know, the, the loss of a creative spark. But the other side of it, that's what I was going to hit on though, yeah. is, and I want you guys to think about this though, is how much, how much impact does it have that we can approach this as artists, you know, whereas someone, the guy down the street, you know, it's just, you know, I mean, they're, they have to, you know, they, don't, they can't go to foundations and, you know, all these folks, whatever, whatever, to, to do their stuff. They can't sell a painting and, 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 and buy the land. They have to go through, you know, some bank to get a loan. And, you know, it's just, it's a whole different kind of world, right? So can some of this stuff happen? Obviously. I mean, it does, you know, being in the field of art have an advantage? Mm -hmm. That's, that's. And that's beyond incubating new businesses, which I think is an extraordinary thing that Project Roadhouse has been engaged in doing. Uh, it's also about archiving histories of the neighborhood, too. So I want to talk a little bit, Rick, about uh, any then you be asked because of your purchasing of the record collection, the store collection, that there are ways in which we are um, collecting and archiving the histories of communities that undoubtedly are changing, have changed, continually change, but how do we archive that history in a very interesting way? If you're covering someone who's coming like the wall of all the um, and it's been really a part of what Project Grow Houses is doing. I know the has done that with uh, the record store and the bank. Well, and, and, and Mark, at, at, yeah. at that location, you know, I mean, that's the world stage. You know, I mean, where, where Mark is investing in at the Park Park, it's the world stage, you know, and so that's a, that's a whole new life talk to a bit about that. Each of you, I'd like for you to talk a bit about that. Archive on this piece as well. So, I, I mean, I want to. First, I'll respond to, to Rick's kind of call around, um, you know, entrepreneurial leadership. It's really like, a, I feel like there's a way in which we can talk a lot about the loss of a certain kind of leaderliness. 
you know, like that 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 it seems we're like a nation of service workers. And if we're not, we're like at Golden Sachs. That, that anything that would be leader would not be local. Right? And so 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 I think like say when my dad was a roofer, it wasn't like he was a roofer for other people. He was like, I'm gonna get a tar kettle and I'm gonna start a roofing company. And there was just something that was intuitive, intuitive, it was part of the DNA of a moment. That we ain't gonna be able to get a certain kind of job from them, so we gotta make up the job. And, and so that feels directly connected to me, to the storefront, and to the, the small, the butcher, to, you know, it's like, like uh, Parker House Sausage in Chicago. Dude came from Tennessee, and he had like a little mobile truck, and he would go door to door selling handmade sausage that he would make in the morning. Turn into a multi million dollar black owned business. Selling, uh, you know, selling, selling patty sausages. And, I, and I, I mourn the loss of that code. That, that, that really, yeah, we, we could be tissues and nail, we could do nails and, you know, we have the talent. We don't match the talent with the entrepreneurial stuff to simply go down to the small business bureau and say, I'm a nail technician, I want to start a nail salon. And that, and that everybody is starting from the same place. White like people aren't born with the code that tells them they have it. But what, what sometimes still the cultural difference is, is that there's a, when one decides that uh, they want to access that thing, when they go to access it, they have a lot of access. Right? And so there's, there's two parts. What happened to the leaderliness? And then if one chooses to, when, when the young sister says, I want to be a nail technician, and I start her on her way, will the world be kind to her? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not talking about our costumes. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> now I do what she said, do. Right. Um, lately I've been writing that, that I think we can program anything. Now what the thing is doesn't matter. You know, like it could be a, it could be some books, it could be some old slides, it could be, you know, hot, you know, whatever. But but I think that the more critical part is who do we have in leadership with us? Um, so that when we decide that the houses are gonna be activated, those things are registering as hyper important, like important to the hyper local, to the city nationally, internationally, and it takes a special kind of person that can, um, right, that's why I was so excited when Ryan got all those applause, because there's a way in which um, Project Bow Houses and these things that we're involved in, they're only as good as their connectivity, right? And, and so I would love to talk about, I know that archives are important, but, the, but they, they're only made important if we can access those archives and make them relevant. Uh, is, is so I feel like um, creating the repository is one part of what we've been involved in, and then finding people who can connect the repository in meaningful ways to the people that, that are about. Um, I guess when coming from like his father was a roofer, my mom was a hairdresser, and as long as I can remember, there were many hair salons, and we would open a hair salon rent for a while and move to another place because either the building was sold or the rent rose too high. We never bought anything. My mother was not a person to buy anything, not homes or anything. It's fine. So we had this kind of nomadic existence um, business-wise. So for me, I would watch that and I, I think for me the idea of something sustainable that, that actually could I could sort of locate it, store size it, and kind of have a chance for it to grow, so not dismantle it. So with art and practice, uh, the Merck Park, I felt, was, should be the re repository for contemporary art. And that part of the Merck Park had sort of, through Brockman Gallery, which in the 70s was very present, through the 80s and 90s it fell on sort of weaker times and developing a platform or creating something that was sustainable 
that we couldn't get kicked out of, sold from out from under us, and had to pack up again, reminding me too much of, I think, of when I was a kid. So for me, this idea of sustainability, history, therefore I could archive. We're actually part of the art practice is to create a, 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 an archive of art catalogs of African American artists that you can, that, but that, that will be permanent. So this idea of something, and I feel like I'm, it's just a business that I'm starting that. It doesn't feel that much different than a hair salon. I mean, of course you buy these products. <laughs> but it doesn't feel that different. And it feels, um, you roll up your sleeves and everybody pitches in. I'm not doing it myself. I'm, one of the co-founders is Alan DeCastro. Raise your hand, Alan. He's brother. And Jessica Sermons is the executive director. And Sophia and Eileen Norton's. But we all roll up our sleeves. At, at, at the moment, they're all in my studio. They've taken over my studio because that's where we can work. So I don't really feel as if, I feel you all pitch together to create a platform that we can build from. And that was really the only, the only thing that I kept thinking about when I started to think about where I was going to locate. Glad to hear you say that because I always I remember once we we were we were we went, we went, we went, we went over to uh, we were over at Sigma Jenkins Jenkins your old gallery and when Mark went in and the way he was negotiating I was like this dude is running his his, his, his studio just like a hair salon <laughs> I mean he was he, the way he was just dicing it up and I was like it was it was just so you know it just it felt really comfortable to me because Mark and I have another thing in common too. Is that, we both. I, I used to, I used to do hair too. See? In fact, in fact, I bet I bet you there's at least two or three people in this building that got the haircut. Somebody, somebody, there's somebody in here. I know. The thing <laughs> <you're laughs> <crying> out. <laughs> well, we have a lot of people who are assembled here. We want to expand the conversation for our audience as well. So I'm sure you you have some burning questions. So I'm ready for the first hand to shoot up. Let's go. Up. In the back, in the back, stand up, stand up. I thought you were prepared, Ms. Brian. <laughs> And one thing that I've been thinking about as you've been talking was, as you've been talking about the issue of kind of sustainability and preservation, um, and kind of thinking about like saving the businesses that are kind of still within the communities that you're working with, but also thinking about the issue of land. And I know Mark, you were talking about.